Well, I'm very honored to introduce our speaker tonight. Ed Kalianisi is a warning coordination meteorologist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Ed is uh, from an Air Force family, and uh, if you were to ask him where he was from, uh, it would be uh, New Jersey, Michigan, Washington, Texas, Colorado, the UK, back to Texas, and New York. He's a graduate of the State, of Uni uh, State University of New York with a Bachelor of Science in Atmospheric Science and an MBA in Management from Texas Tech. While he was at Texas Tech, he met his uh, mate for life, and uh, they have a grown son who lives in Norman, Oklahoma. What I found out uh, in talking to him today with the weather and all being as it was, and of course we couldn't have this uh, meeting last month because of the weather, but uh, his son in Norman, Oklahoma had a tornado hit his house. When was that? Uh, Sunday night. Sunday night. <clears throat> so, uh, first-hand knowledge of uh, the damage that can happen uh, uh, with our weather. His hobbies include motorcycles, playing golf, storm chasing, imagine that, motorsports, he's been a seasoned ticket holder at the Texas Motor Speedway in the track when the track opened in 1997. He's a fellow ham radio operator holding the call, catch this, I assume it's a vanity call, W5SVR. <laughs> Think about it. With that, I turn it over to you, Ed. Thank you. Yeah, you guys, you know you're never that lucky to get a, a call sign like that out of the chute. <laughs> no, my, my original one was something like KE4CHC back in 1991. So saying that over the air and having people <laughs> enunciate that, and it, it, uh, Go ahead. it doesn't, uh, doesn't work too well. So that one's a lot better. And I moved from North Carolina to uh, Texas and, and got that, that vanity. So uh, good to be with you uh, guys this evening. Sorry we couldn't work out the uh, February 2nd deal, but uh, it's good to be with you tonight. Joe, uh, Joe's very persuasive in convincing speakers to come talk to you. So appreciate the invitation, Joe. Appreciate your being here. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about several different things. It was mainly going to be focused on severe weather. So um, I was originally asked to kind of maybe abbreviate a spotter talk and kind of introduce some of you that may not be exposed to that, to some of the information we teach spotters. So I've got some of that toward the end. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just jump all over the place and talk about different things. So hopefully it's, it's worth your time. For those that don't know, the, uh, the National Weather Service has national centers and local forecast offices. The Tulsa Forecast Office serves the 32 counties that are color-coded in that, that picture there. So you can see Benton County, Washington County, um, 30 other counties as well that we serve, all the way from the Kansas border down to the Texas border. And Shannon and I are keeping an eye on radar because we've got some tornado warnings right now down here in Lamar County, Texas. That's <clears throat> moving into my southern county. So I, uh, I usually do a lot of the tornado damage surveys. So it's interesting, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of damage surveys that I've done in my career with the Weather Service to actually be on the other end of it this last week. It's, it's a whole different perspective. I mean, I've always had, you know, the uh, empathy for those victims and try to be sensitive when I'm around their damaged property and talking to them and some of them sometimes they they've got loved ones that they've lost in the storm so I've, I've dealt with all that before and for like I said 30 30 years I've been doing this with the weather service and a lot of that time I've, I've done damage surveys and been out meeting with people and especially storm victims so it's interesting to be on the other side of that uh, for for this last week long road uh, one thing that was said to me Monday was uh, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. Some of you guys have probably heard that before. I know the last time I heard that was when my, my wife's oncologist was talking to us. So I know what kind of long road I'm in uh, if, if it's any, anything related to that. So anyway, <clears throat> his, his house was pretty close. He had EF2 damage behind him, uh, to the south of him, 
to the north of them. So luckily he had high end EF1 damage to his house, but it was it's bad enough they're gonna have to gut the whole thing. So Can go I ahead. Ask, what part of Norman did, did your son live in? The southeast side. Highway, the, the, the tornado basically went right across Highway 9, just south of the university, just south of the National Weather Center. So about, he lives about a mile east of the National Weather Center there on Highway 9 and then uh, 24, 24th Street. That neighborhood got, like, like I said, a lot of EF2 damage through that corridor. So <clears throat> anyway, our office serves 32 counties. We are uh, primarily... Our mission there at the Weather Service is to issue forecasts and warnings for the protection of life and property. That's essentially why we're there, but that's not all we do. We compile a lot of weather information, a lot of the information you see on the internet, a lot of information you see on TV, that at some point or another comes from the Weather Service, more than likely. Satellite data, we've got a radar network, um, a lot of the computer models that you see on TV, so you can see it, you can call them up on the internet as well, pretty readily. Uh, those, most of those are being run by the National Weather Service. So that's what we do. We put the information out there for people to use in a variety of different ways. Uh, but issuing forecasts and warnings for days like today is our primary mission. So hopefully we don't have any bad tornadoes today, but it, it's, a, it's a pretty big day. There's a moderate risk for a large area of the country. So um, could be some bad, bad tornadoes again. We rely heavily on our partners in emergency management and the media to fulfill that mission with the Weather Service. So those are our primary partners, our, our emergency management partners and the media partners. There's a couple pictures within our office. Uh, we've got 27 employees, 18 meteorologists. Obviously, we're staffed 24-7 putting forecasts out and watching the weather and putting any kind of information out there, uh, whether it's routine or whether it's event-driven. Normally, we've got two, four, at least two forecasters during the day shift. We've got a third person, and right now at the office, we literally probably have six to eight. I don't know exactly how many we have, but probably seven or eight. So seven or eight people out of, you know, a staff of meteorologists that are 18. So that's, that's a pretty good percentage to work an event like we have going on right now. So the first place we start to issue information about hazardous weather, that could be severe weather, it could be the winter storm we had the last time we were supposed to talk, February 2nd, whether it be flash flooding, wildfire danger, all that information is put in an Outlook product. That's the first place we start talking about that, and usually days in advance. If you're watching the weather for the last week ahead of some of these tornado events, we're starting to discuss that six, seven days in advance. That's not always gonna happen, but sometimes, like these last two events, it's what we call synoptically evident, and you just know there's gonna be, the parameters are coming together, all this, the atmosphere needs to produce widespread severe weather even tornadoes is coming together and it's just a matter of timing that's usually the main difference is it coming uh late thursday night thursday evening thursday afternoon days five six that's sometimes timing is the main difference sometimes we may be missing an ingredient but some of these bigger outbreaks we've been we have all, all the parameters there. It's pretty clear days in advance. We're going to have the parameters. It's just a matter of what the exact timing is going to be. So this could discuss, like I said, severe weather seven days in advance. And we also issue graphics. So weather.gov slant Tulsa, we issued various graphics. If you went to our page right now, I think we probably have three graphics about the severe weather potential for today, the timing of the expected severe weather, maybe a heavy rain graphic. So there could be a variety of graphics that go along with a hazardous weather outlook. The hazardous weather outlook you can get from a weather radio and from our webpage and, and other places as well. But that's probably the easiest way to get it. This is a graphic we put out uh, up January 2nd. That was a big day for this area as well. We had five tornadoes in our service area that day. So you take this off here, Take that date off. Look at that graphic. That could be any April day, May day, very, very easily. Golf ball size hail, potential for strong tornadoes. Doesn't matter the time of year. Mother Nature doesn't care, as we just saw last weekend. Doesn't matter. if It's still February. We shouldn't get those kind of tornadoes. Doesn't matter. We had five tornadoes this day, November 4th. Last year, we had bad tornadoes. We had two EF4s that day. We had EF3 damage in Oklahoma. We had EF2 damage in Oklahoma from EF4 tornadoes that started in Texas and moved across the border. So it doesn't matter what the calendar says. 
<clears throat> here's the tornado watch that was issued for that day. So a watch basically means severe weather's possible in and near that area. Usually a watch issued for large portions of several states, like this example here. And usually it's for six to 10 hours in time. So it doesn't mean severe weather is occurring. It doesn't mean severe weather, uh, it just means a potential exists. Doesn't mean it's occurring yet. So this is kind of be prepared, keep an eye on things. It's for a larger area, for a broader time scale. Usually these are issued for severe weather as the storms start to form. So that's usually when the watch is issued. So if the watch is issued and storms start to develop in the western portion of this watch, over here with you guys, that could be hours and hours before the storms get to you. But the potential exists. We expect severe weather to move into your area within the time frame of the watch. This one here from about 3.30 to 10 p.m. in the evening. So warnings mean severe weather has either been reported to us or we're seeing things on radar that suggest severe weather is developing and is imminent. So this is some of the storms uh, that developed January 2nd. This is actually a supercell. I'm going to talk about that here in a, in a little bit. But this, circular, or this storm here developed, and we issued a severe thunderstorm warning initially, the yellow box on this diagram. And then we upgraded that to a tornado warning, the red box. And it did end up producing a tornado about right here at this kink in this highway that went on for several miles to the northeast. We update warnings with severe weather statements. So I'm going to talk about ways to receive warnings here in a little while. Warnings makes things happen. It makes your phone buzz. It makes your weather radio go off in the middle of the night. It makes the TV scroll pop up. Warnings make things happen. That's the point. But for a warning that's in effect for 45 minutes, we may update that warning. The information in that warning, we may update three, four, five times. Those updated statements don't make the same things happen that warnings do. So to get the most up-to-date information, Follow those updated statements. We call them severe weather statements. If you're following like a automated system, like the weather radio, the weather radio will replace the warning message with the update. So we've got coding in there that says, this update statement is for the tornado warning in Benton County, not the tornado warning down in Sebastian County. So it'll automatically replace that warning on the weather radio cycle. And there's other ways too uh, to receive that, but make sure you're, you're looking at the most up-to-date information because that warning makes things happen, but you want more information than just that warning. That warning could be 20 minutes old. It could be a whole different animal. We issue that warning, it, it could be for 60 mile an hour winds and one inch hail, and 20 minutes later it's producing baseballs and 80 mile an hour winds. So it's a whole different animal. So as long as, like this polygon here, as long as that is the area threatened, that thing could increase, it could, as, it could do a lot of different things, change, it's usually gonna change over the period of 45 to 60 minutes. We're not gonna reissue that warning just because it's now got baseballs instead of quarters. So we're gonna update that with a follow-up uh, update statement. So you really pay attention to those update statements. This is basically the process by which warnings are issued to the public, basically. It's, it's a five-step process. Those partners I talked about earlier, emergency management, the weather service, media. We all have roles in this system here. So if any one of those steps breaks down for one reason or another, that's when we start to have problems. People don't receive the warning. The warning doesn't get issued. The warning doesn't get disseminated right. People response to the warning. They weren't prepared. They didn't understand that storms don't always move in from the southwest. They can move in from the northwest. And you need to be prepared for storms that are there as well as storms that are there. Both of them on a given day could be moving into your area. It just depends on the atmospheric winds and the wind profile. So any one of these steps breaks down, the warning process in general breaks down for that subset of the community. So, so we, um, first step is obviously detecting severe weather. We use radar, obviously. Radar is very, very good. Um, when I first got into weather service in 1991, it's a whole different animal, what we, what we use now, night and day. It's very, very good, but it's got limitations. It's technology. It's got limitations and there are known limitations. One limitation is the further you are from the radar antenna, the higher the beam is going to get. The beam is being sent out as low as we can send it without having a bunch of ground clutter messing up the, the signal. 0.4 degrees off the horizon. That's about as low as we can send it. 
but the problem is the earth curves. So the beam's going straight out, but the earth is curving. So it's getting higher and higher off the, you guys understand radio waves, the same kind of thing. So this is a, a, a beam of energy that's being sent out in a relatively straight line and it's getting higher and higher off the ground the further it gets over the radar antenna. Not only is it getting higher off the ground, but it's also widening, it's broadening. So close to the radar, that beam is fairly narrow. Further away from the radar, the beam is broader and it's harder to detect some of these subtle features that sometimes we see in severe storms. So we use radar, but we know that it has limitations, so that's not the end all, it doesn't see everything. We need other information, spotter information is key. It helps us kind of calibrate radar. Radar looks like we probably have golf ball size hail in that storm, that doesn't mean we have golf ball size hail in that storm. Maybe it's only quarter size, maybe it's only nickel size, maybe it's a lot of hail versus big hail. So the radar signal kind of gives us information, but it doesn't, it doesn't tell us everything. And that varies from day to day, from, from one day to the next. The radar uh, signature for one size hail could be totally different. We also use environmental data. What does the environment suggest? Well, obviously today, down in southeast Oklahoma, where there's a tornado watch right now, and there's been multiple tornado warnings over the last hour or two, the environment is conducive for long track damaging tornadoes down there. So the environment is suggestive of tornadoes. If a storm starts to get into that evolution that it looks like it's about to produce a tornado or something we're familiar with that tends to be the cycle or the evolution of a tornadic storm, issuing a tornado warning pretty quickly on an environment like today. This is not going to be one of those things, well, radar signal's pretty strong and I need more information. No, it's starting to go through that evolution. Probably going to be a tornado warning put on it pretty quick because this is the kind of environment that you're going to get tornadoes in. So this is where storm spotters are most important, helping us detect severe weather. What should storm spotters report? Well, sustained organized rotation, so persistent rotation. That's what we teach storm spotters. Tornadoes, a funnel cloud is a rotating column of air aloft. A funnel cloud doesn't become a tornado until it reaches the ground. That doesn't mean the cloud reaches the ground necessarily. Sometimes the tornado is on the ground, but the condensation doesn't reach all the ground. So the condensation may be up halfway, three quarters of the way to the ground. The cloud isn't actually touching the ground, in other words, but you can see the spin. You can see the debris underneath that descending funnel. So that's not a funnel cloud if the circulation is on the ground. That's the tor tornado is the circulation from the cloud base to the ground. And also rapidly rotating wall clouds. That's what we suggest spotters report to us. And I'll talk a little bit more about that with the supercell here in a little bit. As far as hail goes, severe weather is classified as damaging winds, 50 knots or more, hail, quarter size or larger. So winds and, winds and hail, wind uh, damage equivalent to 50 knots or 58 miles an hour, large tree limbs being snapped off trees, not little branches or little twigs, but three inch diameter hail or uh, tree limbs snapped off trees. That's probably about a 60 mile an hour wind. And we suggest to be as descriptive as they can when it comes to reporting the damage. Um, it just helps give us a better idea what kind of wind speeds we're probably looking at. How many people have been to spotter training before? There are a few faces I recognize in the room here, so quite a few of you actually. Um, well, those of you who've been to before and maybe want to go again, we've actually since, uh, what's it, March 13th, I think, 2020, standing out in the parking lot after the Benton County meeting with the emergency management coordinator talking about COVID and who knows what's gonna happen. The next day we shut it all down. So that was the last spotter talk I did in person until, well, I started to do some in closed groups about six months ago or nine months ago, but uh, as far as the public goes, we didn't start doing them again until this year. They've been online and virtual. So this year we've actually got a pretty full calendar of in-person spotter training, but we're also gonna do three online sessions as well. So how do we suggest spotters make reports when we, we talk to our spotter groups? There's a variety of different ways, depending on their, their situation. Well, here we go with ham radio. That's still an important one. I'll talk about that here in a minute, but we have, uh, well, I'll just wait for the next slide. But there's a variety of different ways. We've got working through your emergency management coordinator, um, telephone, social media, spotter network, we follow that. Um, we've got a web form to make it easy for spotters to report that. You can email me directly, email the office directly. So there's a bunch of different ways to report 
any of those criteria on this previous slide, any kind of damage, please relay that to us. Be surprised at how little information we get sometimes as far as reports go. Well, they must know that. Well, they had golf ball size hail in their warning, so they must know that I just got golf ball size hail. You'd be surprised. We really don't know, need, uh, know that. We really need all the reports we can get. So as far as our local ham radio operations, we've got about a dozen net controllers that work out of our office. Um, we use different repeaters from some of the Tulsa clubs, the Tulsa Repeater Organization. We use uh, their VHF repeater mainly for Tulsa County. So we separate so, because there's so many hams in the Tulsa County area. When storms are in that, they want to do a separate net for Tulsa County area storms. And then we've got the broader, um, broader area with that, the TARC repeaters, the W5IAS wide area link system. So that's the most up to date list of those repeaters that I, uh, that I have. But we don't want that net operated every time we issue a warning every time there may be a severe thunderstorm. That's not, we're not activating that regional net for that. That's, these guys are volunteers. You guys know as well as I do in the springtime, they could be in our office reading warnings for hours and hours and hours and just have a couple hail reports because you know, it's not a big event it's like today. It's not a widespread event like today. Weather fatality. So let's look at some weather safety information real quick. So flooding tends to kill more Americans every year than anything else. Lightning, those numbers have come down a big, big uh, number, probably half in the last 15 years or so. It was close to the number of tornado fatalities, which is around 70 or 80 or so a year. So lightning used to be that many. Lightning safety education and people taking lightning safety precautions has brought that number down, way down. Matter of fact, you look at the numbers for the last 10 years, well, 17. 17. So instead of 80. So in the last 10 years, the average is 17. And I don't think there's a year in that decade that we've had over 20, to be honest with you. Matter of fact, the record low number was 16 during that, uh, that period. So it's been, it's been in the teens for a lot of the last decade, the last 10 years. How about locally? So this is for Arkansas, and I'll talk about our local area too. But Arkansas, we averaged 37 tornadoes a year. Last year, we, uh, we confirmed 39. Six of those 39 tornadoes is what we consider significant. And when I say significant, basically EF2 or greater damage. EF2, EF3, EF4, or EF5 damage. So six out of 39. Small percentage. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some data here in a little bit, but that's, that's pretty typical. Usually significant tornadoes, when we get an EF3 tornado, EF4 tornado, even the EF2 that hit my son's house, that's pretty rare. We don't see that many times. Even, even here in the Southern Plains, we um, 15 to 20% usually, no more than that. And that six out of 39, that, that's right there. So it's, it's actually below 15%. So four flash flood fatalities in the state, no tornado fatalities, the four flash flood fatalities one in Carroll County, one in Washington County, two in Benton County. Those are, the, those are the Arkansas flash flood fatalities. All four of them occurred in our forecast area last year. Actually, we had six in our forecast area. The other two that I didn't just mention were in the county adjacent to Washington, Adair. And about, I think half of those were vehicle related. Usually it's more. The percentage of people dying in flash flooding is actually higher than that. Usually it's, it's mostly people dying in, in vehicles. So locally, we had 23 tornadoes in our service area. We averaged 20 in the long term, so we a little bit above average last year. Uh, of those 23 tornadoes, only two were significant. I talked about both of them. Well, I talked about one of them earlier. One of them was the one that moved out of Lamar County, where the tornado warning is right now. 19 mile long, one mile wide path, it cut into Choctaw County after it produced F4 damage in Lamar County, the county in Texas that Paris is in. And then we had the Springdale tornado last year, the EF3. That was actually the strongest tornado in our area. There's the damage path that I surveyed. So we had EF3 damage in uh, at least two spots. We had a lot of EF2 damage within that damage track. But 
the way we rate a tornado, it could be like the the uh, the Norman tornado. I guess it's about 27 miles long that path length. When we survey the damage, the worst damage anywhere in that path, that's what the whole tornado is. So that's why I say those two tornadoes on November 4th are rated EF4, even though Oklahoma didn't have EF4 damage. The tornado produced EF4 damage in Texas before both of those things moved into Oklahoma. One of them moved into Choctaw County, the other one moved into McCurtain County near Idabel. You heard about the Idabel tornado, remember that one? Go ahead. Springdale tornado. Three. EF3. Yep. No, we had EF3 damage in two different spots. Uh, the elementary school and then that trucking warehouse on 412. Both of those were EF3 rated damage indicators. So. So real quick, we touch on flooding. Like I already kind of commented on that, but most flash flood fatalities occur with vehicles. We had six in our area last year. Back in 2019, we had seven. Usually we're having a few. This, this area of the country, normally with the terrain we get and the, the frequency of very heavy rainfall that we tend to get here, we usually have a, a few flash flood fatalities every single year. Um, a lot of the fatalities occur in situations like this. We had a lot of road erosion. So the water undercuts the road, it undercuts the bridge, it undercuts the low water crossing. Then somebody drives into that because they think they have a better feeling for how deep it is. Well, the road is actually not there. So you think it's a foot of water over the road. Well, the road's not under there, at least portion of it. So f imagine this Ford pickup here driving toward me. He's already in floodwaters. That, that zone right there, if this bridge is underwater, where he's at is probably underwater too. So that's the extent of the, the flooding that we're looking at here. So he's probably already in a flooded area where he is. Keeps driving, I'm familiar with this. You know, my house is just a half mile away. I don't wanna drive 10 miles out of the way to go around and get my house. It's only a half mile away and I've seen the water this high. I've driven through that a number of times, no big deal. Well, this time the road's not there. So the, the, the truck comes driving into the, the flooding, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper, and all of a sudden the right tire drops. And now the truck is pointed up straight in the air like that. That's, that's how literally how these situations evolve that we have fatalities. Lightning, uh, like I said, the numbers have come down. That's really good news. Last year we had 19 lightning fatalities across the country. We used to talk about watch for the flash of lightning, count the number of seconds before you hear thunder, divide that by five or six or something to determine the distance from the storm, distance from the lightning. We don't, we don't suggest that anymore. If you're close enough to hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. It's that simple. Now, most people aren't being struck by lightning during the heavy rainfall. You know, they're taking shelter once the rain starts. Most people are struck by lightning when the storm is approaching before the rain and after the rain ends, they go outside before the storm's far enough away and they get struck on the backside of the storm. So with that in mind, outdoor activity should be suspended if you can hear thunder and probably ought to wait 30 minutes. Give it 30 minutes after you see lightning for the last time. After you hear thunder for the last time, wait uh, 30 minutes. That's gonna give that storm enough time to move far enough away from you where the odds of being struck have been reduced very, very low. So those are the lightning safety rules that we, uh, we urge now. Now, the NCAA and some high schools, they use eight miles. So lightning within eight miles is what suspends them, but they also use this. So sometimes this is challenging. You hear thunder, start the clock again. You hear thunder, start the clock again. So sometimes that delay can be pretty lengthy. These storms are just kind of continuously developing over and over near the same spot, which we've, we've seen. Uh, there was an Oklahoma State and University of Tulsa game back a few years. It's supposed to start at like 9.30 in the evening. This kind of situation happened. I think it got started like 12.30 in the evening. It didn't get done a little like 3.30, quarter to four or something. So that, that was, they were being safe. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. Wait 30 minutes. If, if you're still here in Thunder, you can have people struck, especially when they're standing on a metal bleacher. So, I mean, the rule is the rule. It's, it's unfortunate people's you know 
days were messed up, you know, with that kind of a waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and not knowing when the game's going to start and all that. But that's that's weather safety. You have to be safe. And that's what has brought those numbers down. So hail tends to be the costliest thunderstorm related event. Your vehicle is going to provide some shelter from hail, probably golf ball size, 1.75 inches or so, a little, little less than two inches in diameter. Your vehicle will provide some protection, but anything bigger than two inches, you're going to start to lose windows. So your vehicle is not safe, it's not protecting you if you're in big giant hail bigger than two inches, bigger than about the size of a golf ball. And you can see some of this stuff is being wind blown. So there was uh, Memphis, Texas, which is in the uh, Southeast Texas Panhandle. I think this was Sunday also. I think they had a 114 mile an hour thunderstorm wind gust and they also had golf ball size hail at the same time. So imagine golf ball size hail being blown over 100 miles an hour laterally. That's what you get. Uh, the hail's just going right through the windows into the house. I mean, so it's some of these some of these storms, even without tornadoes, can be very, very damaging, especially when they've got big hail, especially when they've got severe winds in combination with the big hail. So they can be pretty damaging. I mentioned earlier the definition of a tornado, the vortex extends from the cloud base. The cloud is actually producing the tornado and the vortex extends to the ground. Doesn't necessarily have to have condensation all the way to the ground like this example here. Condensation could stop about right here or somewhere up in here, but you still see this stuff. That vortex is on the ground if this is happening, despite the fact there may not be condensation connecting it all the way. So when do tornadoes occur around here? Like I said earlier, Mother Nature doesn't care what time of year it is. If those parameters are coming together, it is what it is. You're going to get tornadoes. It doesn't matter if the map says or the calendar says January or May. Like I said, January 2nd, as good as any May outbreak, 11-4 last year. We had 11 tornadoes in our area. That, that's as good as any May day. That setup was as good as any May day. So our primary season here obviously is in the spring. We typically think mid-April to mid-June is our peak. But you can see where we're at. So February is typically a fairly slow month for tornadoes, but then it starts to ramp up pretty rapidly. Once you get into March and April and May peaks, and then it drops pretty rapidly in June. The reason that is because the jet stream starts to shift to the north away from this area. That's their tornado season up north. Ours is pretty much over at that point most times. Although, as you can say, we still get tornadoes in the summertime. That's not, not real normal, but you can see these stars down here. I know this is kind of messy, but I like to use this because it just gives you an idea in the last handful of years. This is as far as January goes, since we've already been through January and February, we're looking at seven years of Januarys and Februarys, and the other months we're looking at six years. We have a secondary season here in this area of the country in the fall. We get severe weather every single fall. We don't get tornadoes every single fall, but out of the last six years, five out of the last six years, we've had fall tornadoes in our area. So it's not that unusual to get October tornadoes, November 4th, we had a lot of tornadoes in our area, about half the annual number we, we confirmed on that one day, 11. And we only confirmed 23 last year. But January 2023, we had five. So that number is actually current. If I updated that, that'd be 34 now. So look at those stars there. Four out of the last seven years, we've had January tornadoes in this area. That's not that unusual. Again, if the atmosphere has everything it needs to produce tornadoes, it doesn't matter what the what the calendar says. Time of day. <coughs> Obviously, we get a lot of nighttime tornadoes here, but despite popular opinion or thought, most of our tornadoes are still occurring during the daylight hours. 70%, as a matter of fact, occur between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. About two-thirds, a little less than 70%, actually occur between 3 and 9 p.m. 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. So two-thirds are, are occurring in the afternoon and evening hours. Now, this is a big number. 9 to midnight, that's a big number. You go further west, western Oklahoma, west Texas, western Kansas, that number is a lot less if you looked at their data. If you go east of here, it's probably higher than this. So we're kind of in the middle. Most of our tornadoes occur during the daylight hours, but we still get a pretty decent percentage that we're dealing with this stuff after dark. Kind of hinted at this earlier, but we rate tornadoes based on the damage that we find. So we go 
first of all, if it's not clear whether it's tornado or wind, we assess this is tornado damage. This is not straight line wind damage or vice versa. So sometimes it's not clear cut. Sometimes it's pretty clear cut. We know we're going to tornado damage. So we have to go, we can't look at the tornado and say that's an EF3. We can't look at pictures on the internet and say that's EF3. It may be EF3, like the Norman tornado. That thing happened about 922, I think it hit my son's house. Hour and a half, two hours later, I'm starting to see stuff on Twitter. Cars flipped upside down, homes with roofs off it. I'm looking at that road, oh crap, that's two blocks from him. Oh crap, that's one block from him. So I'm starting to get a feel, this is pretty serious. And uh, that's EF2 damage right there. That was a lot of the damage in some of the houses in Norman. You probably saw it on TV or maybe still seen it. I don't know what they're showing on TV. I ain't been watching TV for several days. But that's the F2 damage. So we go to the damage and we assess as many damage indicators as we can. Homes, businesses, poles, trees, uh, antennas, shopping malls, whatever it hit, we've got, we've got indicators that suggest what the wind speed is. So a permanent home, this is two stories by the way. This is a two story house, a nice house. This is in Broken Arrow. Um, this neighborhood, there's probably a handful of houses that were built like this one, nice houses, two-story houses that look like that after the tornado. One story. The roof is gone, the second floor is gone. But notice the first floor exterior walls are still upright. That gives us a feeling how strong the winds were. So it took the second floor, it took the roof, but it didn't start taking the first floor walls. So the winds were most likely, if that house was built the way we think it was built, this is the, the wind speeds. So I think I rated that one 125 to 135 miles an hour, which is a high-end EF2. So EF3 starts at 136, and I'm just, just below that. If you start to lose exterior walls, I probably would have went three with this one. But the, it was all solid. This home, that home, this other home, this home, it all suggested that high-end EF2. So that's how we rate tornadoes. Has to be damaging. So what happens if a tornado is out in the middle of nowhere? What happens if it's in the middle of some trees here in Northwest Arkansas that's, you know, it's churning up the trees. We see a debris signature on radar, but I can't access where that damage was. I know there was damage because I had a debris signature on radar, but I can't get to that area by road. I have to rate that thing EF unknown because there's no damage that I can access or rate. So I can't estimate the wind speed. So that thing's gonna be rated EF unknown. So here's a breakdown of the tornadoes. I said earlier, EF2 and greater tornadoes account for about 15 to 20% of tornadoes overall. So most tornadoes are not reaching EF2 or greater categories. They're weak, EF0, EF1. That doesn't mean they're not deadly. Most people can survive them though, if we're doing the stuff that we've been told since we're about this big, because that stuff is still valid, most of it is anyway. So those are survivable. We ends up to about 110 miles an hour. EF2s start to uh, produce longer track damage, typically, and the wind speeds are higher. So that picture at the bottom left, that's EF1 damage. You're peeling the, the roof decking portions of it off the roof. That's EF1 damage. This is EF2 damage to some mobile homes. The, the, actually, I think that was over in Adair County, just to the west of where we're at now. Um, that was a, a handful of mobile homes look like that. Uh, the frames were all twisted and mangled and they were just destroyed. So that's EF2 damage. And this is EF4 damage here. That was some damage up in Pitcher, Oklahoma back in 2008. But you've got basically most of the walls, if not all the walls down on the foundation. And that's, that's pretty solid F4 damage. And again, we try not to rate the tornado based on one point, one spot. Try to make it consistent. Okay, does the tree damage support the EF2 damage to the house that's 200 yards away, 50 yards away, that supports the damage to the outbuilding. So we try to, to make it consistent because one thing may be built, maybe not as quite as good as, as something else and we don't want to just rate it based on one single structure if we can. So as I said, most of the, the tornado safety uh, things we've been, talked to, we've been told since we we're real little are still valid. Basically, it's a summarize it, get in, the, uh, the picture I showed you earlier, get down, because that's usually the last part of the home to go. 
So get into the interior rooms, small interior rooms, away from the exterior walls, away from windows as much as you can, get in, get down off the second floor, off the third floor apartment or whatever to the lower floor, because that, that's the last to go typically. The upper floors, the roof, that's usually the first to go. And then cover up. They're even suggesting if you have helmets handy, a motorcycle helmet, a football helmet, to even put that on. Anything to protect your head from getting hit with flying debris. <clears throat> so what does a tornado look like on radar? Well, the, the, <clears throat> to summarize the next few slides, it doesn't look like one thing. It, it looks totally different all the time. It doesn't look like one thing, which makes this challenging. So this is a Cincinnati, Arkansas tornado. How about that? That ain't May. That ain't April. That's New Year's Eve Eve at 6 o'clock in the morning. You guys probably remember that if you've been here long enough. EF3. Multiple fatalities. Debris falling out of this thing. XNA Airport closed from the debris falling out of this thing. The damage path ended well before it got to the XNA Airport. So that's what that tornado looked like on radar. The velocity data, this is velocity by the way. All the, all the radar images I'm going to show you, the velocity curve that I show you is going to be the same. There's different color curves for both this, this is reflectivity, that's the rain and hail falling out of the cloud. This is the velocity, the motion of the air around the cloud or in the cloud. So the, the curve, the color curve I'm going to show you, it's red is away from the, the radar and green is toward the radar. So that velocity signature on that storm was very, very clear cut what was going on there. Not so much in the reflectivity. It's just kind of, I mean, there's high reflectivity there, but that doesn't strongly say, hey, there's a strong tornado occurring right now. The velocity data, there's no doubt. Here's what the Siloam Springs tornado looked like. Now this is from a line. The Cincinnati tornado was from a supercell, individual discrete storm. This is from a line. This actually developed back in Oklahoma and went on almost to Beaver Lake. So that was on the ground almost 30 miles, that tornado. This is from the INX radar, which is to the west. So red is outbound, green is inbound. So here's your strong circulation right in here. This is just east side of Siloam Springs. And you've got a little bit of a reflectivity notch on the front end. So a little bit of a, a hookish looking feature there. So that looks a little more classic. That one does. But again, that's in a line. Normally lines, like if you look down at the radar right now, just north of the Red River all the way into central Texas, there's a squall line. Normally that squall line does not produce tornadoes. Well, the, they've had a tornado warning in Lamar County on the north side of that line and down near Belton, Texas, south of Waco or near Waco last time I looked. So there's areas within that line right now that produce a tornado. Sometimes you don't, you don't have any tornadoes with the line. That's not typically what you see. But this one here, this day, that produced a tornado. Here's what the Springdale tornado looked like last year. That isn't scary at all. The reflectivity of that storm, that's not scary at all. The velocity, uh-oh, this is starting to look bad. This is from the uh, Fort Smith radar. And this is a dual pole product that we look at to suggest if the beam is hitting debris. That one's not showing debris just yet, but it was about to start. So between the velocity and the debris panels of the radar data, we knew something bad was happening. So the, the reflectivity in that case didn't really show much. Now this is a whole different animal here, the Mayflower Valonia tornado back in 2014, you remember that one? I think that was on the ground like 65 miles or something, multiple fatalities with that, over 21 I want to say fatalities maybe. EF4 damage in at least three locations in that path, pretty classic. Big wrap and hook echo on the back side of the storm. The reflectivity in the hook echo is actually higher than it is where the hail is. That's bad when that happens. That's debris. The reflectivity is so high because the radar beam is hitting a ton of debris in the air and that, that is reflecting the energy back to the radar. So you're getting high reflectivity. There's not hail right there. There's no hail in that. That's all debris, that purple ball there. The, the velocity data is very, very intense. And then the dual pole right in here, you see a minimum value and it's very large. That was a big tornado, if you remember that one. So that blue area in that panel is what I'm looking at. That blue coincides with the middle of that circulation, coincides with the middle of that high reflectivity ball. And here's what the Norman tornado looked like just after it 
basically went across the southeast. It's still in Norman, but it, here's Highway 9 right here. So it's just north of Highway 9. It's got a debris signature on radar, strong velocity signature, high reflectivity. So that one was kind of a, a hybrid between a supercell and a squall line, I would say. Tornado developed very rapidly, but I think it was from a pre-existing circulation from a, a storm earlier on that persisted and then got into an environment it just produced pretty quickly. What makes a storm severe? Tornadoes, damaging winds, and hail. That, that hail there, a couple years ago, five inch diameter hail fell in Fayetteville. So we get that kind of hail. Typically, somewhere in our area, we're gonna get bigger than three inch hail almost every year. You almost guarantee that. Last year, we had four and a half inch hail in our forecast area over near Okima, Oklahoma, which is southwest of Tulsa on I-40 west of Fort Smith. You go west of Fort Smith on I-40, you're gonna go through Okima. We had softball size hail there last year. So that was the biggest hail in our area. Here's a look at a squall line. I just described the squall line going on right now, but this is a good example of a squall line. Normally these things produce damaging wind. So normally if we're anticipating a squall line moving through the air, we're anticipating widespread wind damage. That's almost always gonna be the primary threat. So if you hear us talking about squall lines, you hear the guys on TV talking about squall line moving through, think widespread damaging wind. That's almost always gonna be the primary threat. Occasionally they can get tornadoes out of them and occasionally you can get large hail out of them, but almost all the time damaging wind. So the squall line is one type of storm. We've got single cell storms, we've got multi-cell storms, we've got supercell type storms. All of them can produce tornadoes, but they form the tornadoes in different processes. So a supercell tornado forms differently than a tornado that forms on a squall line. So the, a cloud oftentimes associated with a squall line is what we call a shelf cloud. This is not a, a cloud that tornado forms in. This is a cloud that's indicative of outflow. So you see these a lot. Most lines of storms that approach you, it's going to look like that when it approaches you. You've seen this dozens and dozens of times. A lot of times that cloud is associated with some straight line wind damage because it again it marks the leading edge of outflow with the thunderstorms so usually it slopes downward it comes before the rain does so the gusty winds the outflow of the storm has hit you it's usually cold the temperature could drop 15 20 25 degrees in just a matter of minutes that's the kind of cold outflow i'm talking about so that cloud is undercut by cold air by several thousand feet there's several thousand feet of cold outflow air underneath that cloud, and the cold air has rushed ahead of that cloud. So when you're watching this cloud approach you, like this example here, that cloud right there is moving left to right, so it's moving at me. I'm watching that cloud get higher and higher and higher in the horizon. About when the cloud is over here somewhere, I'm probably gonna get hit by that cold outflow in the face as I watch that thing coming at me. Not when the cloud is over me, it's gonna be ahead of that cloud. And the wind damage, remember the Branson duck boat incident, that happened from outflow ahead of, the, well ahead of the rain and even pretty far ahead of the, the shelf cloud. So that outflow surged miles, a couple miles, actually I think it was probably five or six, surged out five or six miles ahead of the, the rain area and the thunderstorm and ahead of the, the, the main cloud area is even the shelf cloud as well. So that's what caught those guys off guard that the, the lake waters start to get really, really choppy when that outflow first hit them. And it was well ahead of the storms when that outflow hit them. That's gonna be typically the case. That outflow is gonna become uh, pretty strong and can be damaging well ahead of that cloud. So the winds keep blowing as the cloud moves over you, then the rain starts when the cloud moves past you. So the gusty winds start, the shelf cloud moves over you, the heavy rain is on the backside of the cloud. Now supercell thunderstorm has a, a rotating updraft. So it's usually got tens of thousands of feet of deep, persistent rotation on a scale of maybe three to five miles across. So it's broad. It's broad scale rotation and it's deep. And usually it starts in the mid levels of the storm. The ones that become tornadic, that circulation that begins in the mid levels of the storm starts to descend to the low levels or the cloud base. Those are the ones that typically produce tornadoes. The mesocyclone or that circulation is important because that intensifies the updraft of the storm. Almost all of these are severe. By definition, it's an intense organized updraft that's persistent. Usually these are gonna produce severe weather. So almost always we're gonna have at least a severe thunderstorm warning on these storms. 
And although, like I said earlier, the other storms can produce tornadoes, they can produce hail. That five inch hail in Fayetteville I showed you a picture of, one of these, guaranteed. The softball sized uh, hail that I talked about fell in Okima, guaranteed it's one of these, there's no doubt. The EF4 tornadoes in Texas last year that moved up into Oklahoma on November 4th, one of these, no doubt. Most strong and violent tornadoes and most hail that's bigger than two inches in diameter from this thing. Not from a squall line, not from a multi-cell cluster storm, not from a single cell pulse storm. It's from one of these because you need that mesocyclone to support that really high end severe weather event. That's why these are so bad. Doesn't mean every one of these is gonna be really bad, but the potential for this storm is way off the charts compared to the other storms. So the tornado with this storm oftentimes occurs on what we call the rear flank. So that's what we're looking at here. I'm, I'm east of this storm looking west. And the tornado part of this storm, where the tornado forms in this storm, is underneath that vertical cloud, which we call an updraft. And it's behind the rain and hail. So I talked about the shelf cloud. The shelf cloud comes before the rain. That doesn't produce tornadoes. This cloud, a wall cloud, does produce tornadoes. That comes after the rain. The rain and hail come first, the tornado oftentimes comes after that. Now, that doesn't mean that's always gonna be the case. Sometimes the tornado's on the front side of the storm, not the rear flank, but most of the time it's gonna be on the rear flank. So here's, here's a look at a classic supercell. So you've got heavy rain curtain on the other side of where the tornado is going to form. So that's what we talk about with storm spotters to try to position themselves so they can see a tornado when it occurs without this heavy, op opaque rain curtain obscuring their views. You have to be in the right position with some of these storms. Some of them, if there's not a lot of rain wrapping around the updraft, you can see the tornado from multiple angles. But some of them like this, it's going to start to narrow the viewing angle. So positioning is very, very important, not only for safety issues, but also just to see what's happening in there. So we try to position the spotters that they're on the, the tornado is going to be on the front side of any rain curtain that may be occurring. Sometimes it can be totally wrapped in rain. You've heard that it's totally wrapped in rain. The tornado is engulfed in rain. Sometimes it's totally wrapped in rain. There's nothing you could do about it. But the odds are, if you could get in this position, the rain curtain is going to be behind you. Well, this is a supercell in northwest Arkansas. This is what we're dealing with here. So here's a supercell, same storm in Kansas. Here's what it looks like in Arkansas with the hills and the trees and the roads aren't quite as straight. Western Kansas, Texas Panhandle, every, every mile you've got a section line. You can go east, you can go south, you can go north. I can chase that thing all day long because I've got a road network that allows me to stay safe and track with it for a long, long time. Well, here you got the roads all going every which way and around hills and around ridges. And you know, you, you got a lot of trees obscuring your view from the road. So it's a lot more challenging around here, no doubt. So here's what a storm that's gonna produce a tornado will look like. It'll produce a cloud like this. Here's the updraft base right in here. Attached to the updraft base is this lowered cloud formation we call a wall cloud. Usually that slopes downward, pointing toward the rain. And like I said, that cloud oftentimes is gonna come after the rain and the hail. The rain and hail come first. This cloud, which does produce tornadoes, not all of them will produce tornadoes, but if this supercell storm produces a tornado, it's gonna to be from that cloud. That, it's not gonna be from anywhere else. It'll be out of that cloud. This is moving left to right. So this is moving toward me. So the, I'm, I'm standing here. The rain is just north of me. So the rain extends all the way off to the right here. So the rain comes first, the tornadic part of it is behind that, typically. That first slide I, sh I had up in my, with my name on it and all that, that big tornado, this is the wall cloud that produced that tornado. So again, these wall, that's where the tornado is going to be, out of that lowered cloud that's attached to the underside of the, the rain-free base. That's where the tornado occurred. That was, that was an F4 that was about three quarters of a mile wide, that picture of what I started my presentation off at. That's west of me. What to look for? This is a biggie here. I talked about that mid-level mesocyclone deepening to the low levels. We see that on radar. We're starting to see that, that lower cuts in the radar data. We're starting to see that circulation descend from the mid-levels where it wasn't before. Visually, what you're gonna see, you're gonna see that wall cloud develop. As that circulation deepens to the cloud base, you're gonna to start to see the wall cloud rotate. If the wall cloud is not rotating, 
it's probably not going to produce a tornado, at least imminently. It may go on and evolve that way, but it's not going to be any time in the near term uh, future. It has to be rotating at the cloud base because that suggests the mesocyclone is deep into the cloud base in the lower part of the storm. Sometimes the inflow increases going into that storm as this process occurs. Rapid vertical motions is also something you typically see into and around that wall cloud as it becomes tornadic. That was the same storm a couple slides ago that I had the trees overlaid in the hill. So that was that wall cloud that went on to produce this thing. By the time this tornado got to this north-south road right here, north of me, it was about a quarter mile wide. So it went from that wall cloud from a couple of slides ago to this in a matter of minutes. Last couple slides, different ways to receive warnings. So I talked about this earlier. Warning, or warnings make things happen. Alerts, buzzes on your phone, all kinds of different things. What we advise having three ways to receive a warning, just in case one way fails or two ways fail, you're getting in a third way. Make sure you have multiple ways. Don't rely on one. I, well, I only live two blocks from a warning siren. Well, the warning siren's intended for outdoor. Outdoor. The houses are built differently now. They're airtight. It's raining. The wind is hitting the side of the house. It, all that makes it harder to hear the siren sometimes outside so it's outdoor warning system is a siren so don't don't rely on a siren have multiple ways to receive warnings and those ways should be pushed to you so you're not monitoring the weather not paying attention to the weather but warning is issued for your area you're being notified of that that's what we mean so if you're not monitoring these warnings are being pushed i'm going to talk to you about several different ways here uh, different things so a website Warnings, watches, all that will show up on our website. Usually this map, weather.gov slant Tulsa. Those different colors on the map mean different things. And you can see the legend pretty clearly what that means. But that only means one product. That means the most significant watch warning or advisory of what's going to be color coded. That may not be all that's in effect for your area. So you can click on this map. You can enter your zip code at the top left hand corner there. And more detailed information is going to come up for that point you clicked on the map or that zip code. All the watches, warnings, and advisories are gonna be hyperlinked. So this is one of those places you can have access to that update to the severe weather statement, or the update to the warning, the so-called severe weather statement. You can read the tornado warning, read the tornado watch, read the flash flood warning. All that'll be linked here. Click on that and those products will, will pop up so you can read the actual warning message. Wireless emergency alerts, real quickly touch on this. So in this area of the country, you're gonna receive basically weather service warnings, tornado warnings, severe thunderstorm warnings, the high-end ones, flash flood warnings, the high-end ones. So this is current state. This is where we're at right now, as far as I know. So we got 360 character messages. We removed all flash flood warnings, and the only thing being pushed through this is now the higher-end ones, the ones that, can, that have tags at the bottom, coding at the bottom of the warning that indicates higher end flooding. So swift water rescues are occurring. Evacuations are being done to buildings from flooding. We put this higher end tag and that kind of a warning, those will be pushed to you. So you're not gonna receive every single flash flood warning anymore. The only severe thunderstorm warnings you're gonna receive nowadays are ones that we include destructive tag at the bottom of the warning. And we include that when the baseball size hail or 80 mile an hour wind gusts are possible. So higher end severe thunderstorm warnings will be pushed through this. You're not gonna get golf ball size hail and 60 mile an hour winds. If that's what we have in our warning message, you're not gonna get that. If we upgrade that to baseball size hail, then you'll get that warning. You'll get that follow up statement that we include the baseball size hail destructive tag in. So you'll get that and you'll get all tornado warnings and you'll also get tornado warning updates that we include catastrophic, which is our so-called tornado emergency. Very, very rare, but you're gonna get every single tornado warning. Now, if you're on vacation along the Florida coast and there's a hurricane warning, you'll get that there. But this is where your phone is. By the way, this is not from the weather service. This is from your cell phone provider, your AT&T, Verizon, whatever network you're on. These are from your cell phone provider. So they're, they're pushing weather service warnings to you, but this is not from the weather service. This is an important key right now too. They're trying to minimize the bleed over. So some of the newer phones, probably about 70% of the phones out on the market right now are being used right now, can receive that warning about a 10th of a mile. So if you have newer technology phones, newer phones, you're probably receiving it to a 10th of a mile. If you get that warning on your phone, you're probably in the warning. 
Now, Shannon can relate that she's, she's actually, I think personally you experienced it. You had a friend experience in Little Rock for one of the big tornado warnings there that they weren't in the warning, but they still got that on their phone. I think one of those examples of bleed over is like 40 miles from the tornado warning. The tornado warning was back in Oklahoma in Farmington area. One of the, the cell phone towers was transmitting that warning as if they were in the warning. So that's usually on one carrier. That's usually one cell tower. We push that up the chain, they get that fixed. So nowadays, they've, they're, they're really, really targeting these things very, very accurately. So if you have an older phone, you may not be receiving it that close. If you upgrade your phone, you're probably gonna start re receiving to a tenth of a mile. So literally, if you're not in the, the polygon that we issue, you won't get it. Now, I, I heard from your introductions, most of you guys are from Benton County and Washington County. So Benton County has BC Alert. Some of you may have this, some of you may be familiar with this. This is something you sign up for, it's free. There's a web address for that. Washington County has code red, which is similar to this. Go to Washington County Emergency Management page. You could probably sign up for this, but this is pushing warnings to you. So a lot of times I'm issuing the warnings in the office and my phone is buzzing for Rogers County because I'm on code red from Rogers County where I work or where I live rather. So I've got my house on code red. So I get, my cell phone gets called, my home phone gets called, my wife's cell phone gets called. So I, I use this, I would utilize this. This service is very good. All communities don't have this. So BC Alert is good for Benton County. Code Red is good for Washington County. Everybody doesn't have that. This is a really good system, really good service to sign up for. Like I said, I utilize my own Rogers County where I live. So that's all I brought for you this evening. Um, there's my contact information. This link here, all the weather service, FEMA, Red Cross, brochures, flooding, ice storms, severe weather. There's a couple spotter brochures you can download there. Uh, different things. So you can go to that site. There's a whole bunch of different weather information and brochures on that one. Um, anybody have any questions? I know we're kind of a little bit late. Anybody have any questions? Quite a few. What's that? When? Left us off everything. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, we we serve northeast Oklahomans in northwest Texas or northwest Arkansas. Sorry about that. You the only one from Missouri? Yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. That tornado in Joplin. I know you know about it. Yeah. So you didn't have you didn't get to go see that or you just let Missouri do it. He's basically asking if, if I had anything to do with the Joplin tornado. Um, no, not specifically, not as far as surveying that. Weather service office tend to survey the tornadoes that occur in their area. Now that Mayflower Valonia tornado that I showed the radar imagery, I did have a part in that. Yeah. I helped the Little Rock office survey that tornado path. Um, so sometimes we get called into different areas to help if there's a lot of tornadoes to deal with. I'll get mine done and I'll head over and, and help them because they're, they're overwhelmed. Like the Ida Bell tornado I talked about on, on November 4th, that's officially in Shreveport, Weather Service Office in Free Shreveport's area. But we were gonna be in the northern part of that county anyway. The fatality that occurred that day was actually not in Ida Bell. It wasn't where the EF4 damage occurred. It was basically an EF2 that was in the north corner of that county that we were gonna be nearby anyway. So occasionally we'll do surveys outside of our area, but normally we stick to our area. So no, I didn't have anything to do with that. But I did have, uh, we had a tornado in Delaware County, Oklahoma, that moved into McDonald County, Missouri. It, it, uh, it literally right on the border, about 100 yards east of the state line, it produced marginal EF4 damage that same day that Joplin got hit. So if Joplin didn't get hit, that may have been the, the story of the day. That may have been the worst tornado of the day. Joplin. But obviously Joplin was way, way worse than Joplin that. Joplin was a mess. I yeah. lost a house up there that my mom lived in, and she survived in the closet. That's when we moved her down here. We were, my house up there was just right in line with St. John's. And so when we were watching down here in Bella Vista, and the minute the camera, on Channel 7 
But then I told Heather, I said, it's a tornado and it's probably rain wrapped. And it was, that's exactly what it was. And so we were up there less than 45 minutes because we live right on the state line in Bella Vista. And uh, it was bad. Yeah, 162 fatalities, I think, in that. So, yeah, it was, it was very bad. Do you have a tornado shelter in your house? Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every house I've owned since I moved to Texas. I, I moved from North Carolina to Lubbock. I had a tornado shelter in that house. I moved to, or I moved to Fort Worth. I had a tornado shelter in there. I had a tornado shelter in my Lubbock house. I moved here from Lubbock, and I've, I've had two houses here in Tulsa area. And I've had two tornado shelters in both. And my son was in his tornado shelter when it hit his house. So uh, we've got an <laughs> above ground safe room in his house that he, he got in in the garage. It's a good thing because his, his, his house is literally covered in broken glass, debris, chunks of fence that come through the broken window, through the wall, into the wall. I mean, there's debris all, all in it. It's just a mess. So if you're not in shelter or an interior room trying to minimize the impact of that stuff flying around, you're in trouble. But go ahead. What kind of shelter do you all have? Because I've seen the in the garage ones, which that's what my like son has. Car would go on top of that. You no, know, he's his not underground in the garage. They make them in the ground under in the garage, and his is a about a four by six steel room, basically. That's Texas Tech Wind Engineering have tested the the materials that went into building that. Above ground shelters, if they're built to code or standards building codes, safe room codes, or using materials that have been tested by wind engineering people like at Clemson or Texas Tech, that thing above the ground doesn't have to be below the ground. Above the ground safe rooms are as safe as below the ground safe rooms. I've seen them. It's if they're built right. Now, let's go back to that Mayflower Valonia tornado. Well, there was a safe room fatality in that. So there was the, the room itself was cinder blocked walls, cinder block ceilings, poured cement into the cinder blocks. You pound on that, I mean, it thud, thud, thud. It's well built, thick walls. Walls, everything's built good. The door that was on the safe room where the fatality was, it didn't even sound that solid, honest to God. It, it's one of these $200 door you buy from Lowe's that is hollow. So that door was not, not an approved door to put on a safe room, unfortunately. So if it's built to code, then in my opinion, it, it's going to be as safe as an underground safe room. Go ahead. And the question, question I have is really probably a topic all by itself here, but the, the predictability of what's happening, because you showed us a lot of real time images, you know, from radar and so forth, but then when they try to make a prediction to say, well, here's the polygon where the, the really bad stuff is happening, now that has to come out of the computational atmospheric models, doesn't it? And how does that feed into your, into your uh, uh, local area of predictions of what you're doing? I would say the outlook comes from what you're saying. The longer term comes from the prediction models. and But the shorter time you get into the watch is probably coming from mesoscale environmental analysis. A lot of that, what, where is the front now? How unstable is the atmosphere? How shared, sheared is the atmosphere? So the, the shorter time frame we're talking about, the less model data is going into that decision. So when we issue warnings, we're not using model data. We've got some shorter term, this is something new that we're added to the equation. We've got some shorter term, high resolution models that are kind of giving us some, some short term predictions. But that's just kind of, right now, that's kind of more developmental stuff. Most of, most of our warnings are not based on models at this point. They're based on radar data, environmental clues of what the atmosphere is supportive of right now, how much wind shear is there, how unstable is the air, and spotter information. So it doesn't include any model data at all, except for some of the shorter term guidance that we occasionally get. Okay, well when you see these, uh, you know, these uh, radar forecasts, where you're watching the real time data that's very detailed, and as soon as you hit the current time, well, that's some of the model data I'm talking about. So you're seeing more and more of this model data that, that 
forecast radar. Forecast radar tells you everything you need to know. That's basically a model output. That may or may not be have anything to do with reality when it actually that time frame shows up. Now, so where's that, where's that that's coming, where's that coming from? That's a model. That's a computer that's model. The National Weather Service models. It could be. There's there's various short term models that are run. Um, a lot of them are going to be from the Weather Service. Like I said, everybody has access. You could call up a model right now and look at data. Um, there's there's a lot of different places to look at computer model data, and you can look at click on forecast snow depth. Here in, here in Springdale, they're forecasting eight inches. Well, that's one model of God knows how many models there are. So it's only one solution. That's the deal with models. We used to look at model data and then interpret the model data and put all the model data together and then make a forecast out of that. Nowadays, you're just seeing model data just splashed out there, especially on social media. Well, here, here's the worst case scenario that I can possibly find in any of the model fields from any of the models right now that's forecasting two feet of snow in Springdale. And that's not the forecast, though. Nobody's forecasting that, but that model data is all over the place. So that's what people, wow, we're going to two feet of snow. Nobody's forecasting that. The Weather Service isn't forecasting that, more than likely, because that's one model that's way out to lunch compared to the other one. So model data is used for guidance. That's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. And for warnings, it doesn't include um, hardly any model data currently. Go ahead. Looking at your graphs and stuff, it doesn't seem that the frequency of the severity of storms has changed much over the last several years. Is that correct? I would say no. I would say it hasn't, hasn't changed. Not changed. No, I would say, I mean, we've, we've had violent tornadoes. We've had devastating floods. We've had incredibly disastrous hurricanes. I mean, we get in a weather pattern where we get like this pattern now. It's been pretty active a lot of the, the winter, the cool season. We've had multiple severe weather events throughout the cool season leading up to now, late winter, early spring. The pattern we're in just was conducive for that. We didn't a lot of, we, the one reason for that is we didn't get a lot of out, Arctic outbreaks that basically plunged into the Gulf of Mexico and pushed all that moisture, the rich, moist, juicy air coming off the water way south in the Gulf of Mexico. We haven't had a lot of Arctic air outbreaks. So that makes that juicy, moist air that we need to support thunderstorms and severe thunderstorms, especially this time of year, it's not far away. The systems are able to pull that very readily and quickly to the north, which is why we've been getting pretty solid outbreaks, even West Texas. The Memphis, Texas, that, that's not something they typically see in February golf ball hail and 100 mile an hour wind gusts from thunderstorms. Usually it starts off east, gradually spreads westward with time into the spring and northward with time into the spring. So, but that's not any long term, this is the new, this is the new way we're gonna get it. It's, weather just doesn't work like that. It's, I mean, we're in a period of an active period, but last year we didn't have a very active period at all. So we had a pretty slow spring. Going into November 4th, we only had 12 tornadoes in our area through early November. Then we had November 4th, now we got 23. So I wouldn't say it's more active long term, it's less active, it's just, it's weather. It, it changes from year to year and that's, that's just how it works. Go ahead. Can you or will you recommend a good app for real-time radar? No, I can't. He's recording me, so I'm definitely okay. not even going to recommend it or nothing. So, okay. no, I can't. As a government employee, I can't. Um, so, I didn't mean to put you on I, I, There's a lot of good ones out there. Um, if you're really that interested, come up with, and I'll tell you what I use um, after we're done here. But I'm, I'm not going to endorse it. I'm just telling you what I use personally. But I'm not endorsing it. Any other questions? Go ahead. La Nina and El, El Nino. Yeah, those things, those affect some of this? Yeah, that affects some of that long-term yeah. stuff I was talking about. Um, the last three years we've been in La Nina. This spring, it's expected to go to neutral fairly rapidly, but that El Nino, La Nina, that normally affects us during the winter months. So once we start to get in the spring months, it starts to kind of lose its it's pull a little bit on the overall weather patterns. But th there's another good example. The last three 
La Niñas, we've had one winter we had very little severe weather at all two years ago. 2011, we had a La Nina that was incredibly active winter and spring. This year, we've had a lot of severe weather. We've lucked out in our area not to have a lot of tornadoes, but Texas and some places very close. We had five already, which again, we averaged 20. We had five already in January. So we're off to a pretty quick start. So La Nina is not the only story is the, is the problem. When we're talking atmospheric fluid dynamics, there's a lot that goes into that. La Nina is one factor, but there's a lot of other things that affect the weather patterns, even the longer term, week, week to week, month to month. So it's not just La Nina or La Nina. That's one factor that typically is discussed. And that, that's the big one that, that you're hearing about. But there's other things going on as well, which is why we get different La Ninas don't mean excessive rain all the time. Sometimes it does, sometimes it means drier. Actually, a lot of times it means drier. But last month we had a wet February. So we had about twice our average rainfall in February. So sometimes it results in that kind of thing. Ed, do you, uh, uh, can you stick around right after the meeting? We might have a couple of other questions. Yeah, for that's fine. Or so. Yeah. We have learned an incredible amount. So how about a big hand for Ed? No. We have a, uh, a growing MCOM uh, presence with our club, and uh, I know a lot of you may be interested in storm spotting and um, taking those classes and that training. So this was a perfect uh, opportunity for us to get a good grounding in this whole field. And Ed, we appreciate you coming all the way over here. I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Joe. Okay. We have a little uh, uh, memento we'd like to give you. All right, you thank you. come over here. And I'll just trade places with you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ted awesome. Calianisi, the Bella Vista Radio Club proudly presents this certificate of appreciation to you for your outstanding presentation at our meeting on February the 2nd, 2023. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> yep. Introduction to Noah and better severe late than weather never. spotting. Yes, better late than never. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank we, you. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your invitation to talk to you guys. Can you hold on that for me? Sure. Can you make me Thanks. look skinnier? <laughs> me too. <laughs>